Hi and welcome to the Virtual Instructions podcast. From creativity to slang and modern drama to psychopathy, we'll showcase a concise and original introduction to a wide range of subjects, wherever your curiosity may take you. So here is today's very short introduction. My name is Kirsten Shepherd Barr and I'm in the Faculty of English at the University of Oxford, specialising in modern drama. I have three main areas of interest. First, how the theatre engages with science and scientific ideas. And second, the historiography of modernism with regard to performance, how theatre figures, or most often doesn't figure, in the dominant narratives of modernism. And finally, the works of the Norwegian playwright Henrik Ibsen, whom I'll be mentioning a bit about later on in this podcast. I found that these areas interact with each other in fascinating ways, and I draw on these interactions in my very short introduction to modern drama. Before I describe the book's contents, think about the magic of live performance, the brilliant acting and directing, the breathtaking scenery, the sound and the lights, the electrifying emotion. Then there's also the expense of the ticket, the babysitter's fees, the race to the bus, the drive through traffic, the struggle to find parking, the annoying person seated next to you, behind you, <coughs> in front of you. Choo! Yet something still makes us want to be there in person, at live performances, witnessing all kinds of drama. This is my starting point for the book, how the audience experiences the theater and how that special relationship between the audience and the performance event has changed over the past century and a half. That is one of the main legacies of modern drama. In my book, I look at the major developments of the modern theater from about the 1870s to the present day, each chapter spanning a few decades. This makes it easy to follow and track the key developments in modern theater, such as realism and naturalism in the late 19th century, the influential theory and practice of Bertolt Brecht, the groundbreaking work of American playwrights like Susan Glaspell and Lorraine Hansberry, the extraordinarily innovative plays of Samuel Beckett, the so-called in-your-face theater of the past few decades, and the reinvention of documentary theater as verbatim drama, as well as many other topics. I mention a lot of plays, playwrights, and directors along the way, but my aim is not to give you lists. You can find those anywhere on the internet, but to provide representative examples that I linger over in some depth. One of the things that's most exciting about plays in general is that they exist in two forms, as both text and performance. I try to emphasize the fascinating interaction between the writing of plays and the conditions of theater, to show that very often how plays are written depends greatly on what technologies are available at a given time. For instance, innovations in lighting and scenography, or in the kinds of theater spaces being built, Such factors influence the drama profoundly, and yet, because the text is the main object of study when we talk about a play, especially a play produced in the past, the role that things behind the scenes play often gets neglected. I'll talk about this a bit more later on. My interest in modern drama started with live theater, first going to plays with my family, then acting in plays, musicals, and so on in school. It wasn't until university that I really started reading plays and studying them. There is nothing like seeing a play live. I was lucky in that my local high school happened to have a brilliant drama program. We put on several major productions a year and took them to local and regional drama competitions and usually won. The thrill and excitement of putting on a play is unlike anything else. Researching and teaching modern drama allows me to remain perpetually involved in theater, but without having to memorize all the lines. So what are the key aspects of modern drama that everyone should know about? Well, one is how, from the 1870s, Ibsen and his contemporaries changed the way drama was written. Ibsen introduced a whole new way of writing dialogue. He renounced verse. He said that modern plays should use modern language and replicate modern speech, contemporary speech. So the dialogue has pauses, it has incomplete sentences, it has the cadences of natural language, the way we speak to each other. And... It also, his plays also did away with the aside, those moments in older plays when you often have a character speak to the audience, acknowledging the audience's presence. Those things disappeared in in Ibsen's plays by the 1880s. And you also don't get very long speeches like monologues or soliloquies. 
Usually, dialogue consists of briefer exchanges. Characters also talk about more everyday things than in many previous plays. Ibsen's plays often deal with really up-to-the-minute issues like the pollution of the environment or the sewage or drains problem. You get that in An Enemy of the People. Or you have really relevant issues even to our own time, such as women's rights and the problems of limited roles for women in society. Ibsen's social dramas of the 1880s presented the audience with uncomfortable private situations and themes, and they positioned the audience like eavesdroppers. But such changes didn't just come out of the minds of ingenious playwrights. Around this time, electricity began to be used in theaters, which meant that you could plunge the audience into darkness while illuminating only what was on stage, thus making the audience invisible and like a fourth wall of a room they're peeking into. Here we have an instance of technology radically affecting and shaping how plays were written and created. Yet when we read and study drama, we sometimes forget this and think that playwrights led the way on such changes, when in fact they were following or taking advantage of developments in staging and scenography. This new, intimate configuration between audience and performance had all sorts of implications for the writing of plays. For one thing, being in darkness quieted the audience, which in turn made it possible for actors to speak softly and perhaps even whisper, rather than having constantly to project very loudly across a busy, chattering public, as in earlier drama. All attention was now riveted on the action. In addition, Ibsen introduced a new way of structuring plays, so that there was a lot of past action that had gone before and was referred to, but the audience had to uncover it by listening closely to the dialogue and picking up clues to piece together the story. It's like a detective novel you might read. It's about the past being suppressed and then coming back to wreak havoc on the present. A good example of this technique is Ibsen's play Doll's House, which is set many years after the events that, in the hands of other playwrights of the time, would have formed the action of the play. The dialogue gradually reveals the true nature of those events and sheds light on the aftermath which we are watching unfold before our eyes. But, and this is another innovation from Ibsen's hand, we don't get a solution or an answer to the dilemma. The play ends without definitely showing us what will happen. We have to figure out the answer ourselves. And that is generally true of a lot of modern plays, which leave the audience to work out a solution to a problem, usually a problem that does not yet have a solution. Another key aspect of modern drama is that it's a great way to learn about the major topics of the time, the times we live in. You can understand the suffrage movement through plays like Votes for Women by Elizabeth Robbins or How the Vote Was Won by Cecily Hamilton. You can learn about modern scientific ideas and the debates and dilemmas they generated by studying science plays like Brecht's Life of Galileo or Michael Frayn's Copenhagen or Sheila Stevenson's An Experiment with an Air Pump. You can study the American Civil Rights Movement and Black Lives Matter through plays like A Raisin in the Sun by Lorraine Hansberry, Dutchman by Amiri Baraka, and the plays of Lynn Nottage and Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, to name a few. And such plays don't just present issues, they present formal innovation, stretching and innovating the very genre of theater itself, challenging what a play is and what the audience's role is in watching it. Modern drama is one of the best illustrations of the relationship of form to content, of the what of a play to its how. When you read or see Beckett's Waiting for Godot, you find yourself wondering, probably, what is going on? Why are there two acts with very little obvious plot or action, no final satisfying sense of closure or denouement? It might not feel to you like a conventional drama, Yet the language and emotional landscape is rich and powerful. The characters seem totally real, and the place is deeply evocative, even if we don't have any idea who these people really are, where they have ended up, and why they are here. There is something uncannily modern and universal about their predicament, and maybe that's what we relate to most in the end. So I know there's a lot more to say about modern drama, but I hope I've been able to spark your interest in it and give you a sense of its remarkable creativity and variety. And our own experiences continue to enrich and alter the kinds of plays I'm talking about. The multiple lockdowns of the pandemic felt eerily like scenes from Waiting for Godot. Let's go. 
they do not move. Waiting for Godot is a play that perfectly captures the sense of limbo and of moving towards a target that just keeps getting further away. I hope you'll enjoy as much as I do the chance to go back to live theater and experience once again performance with all its sensory richness. Yes, including... <coughs> and so on. There is nothing like modern drama and the unique ways in which it shows us our world. Thank you for listening to the Very Short Instructions podcast. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify and Stitcher to receive new episodes directly to your podcast feed. All of our episodes, new and old, can also be found on SoundCloud and YouTube at OUP Academic. Mm-hmm.